Thank you so much. You have your Bible tonight to the Old Testament prophet and the book of Jonah. And tonight we'll begin in Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1. Six miles from the city of Nazareth in Bible times, there was a little village. A little village called gath Hefer, And it was right in the middle of the land that was given to the tribe of Zebulun. You know, there really aren't a whole lot of famous Zebulunites. I don't even know if that's the right word or not. But there weren't a whole lot of them in the Bible that really seemed to do much for the Lord. And, and seemed to make much a difference, but the one who did was this man by the name of Jonah. You know, Jonah is very possible that, that he was either personally trained or was trained by somebody who went to the school of the prophets. And that, of course, was a school that was begun by Elisha. And he trained men to preach the word and to carry on the activities of God. And, and Jonah would have been in that time frame. Jonah would have been a contemporary to men of God like Hosea. And Amos and perhaps even Micah and you know we don't know how long Jonah lives after the book of Jonah but it's possible that he would have been around long enough to meet and to know Isaiah I mean this was a golden age of prophets in the Bible some of the boldest and some of the mightiest men of God were called upon to preach some of the most difficult and, and some of the hardest messages in all the Bible and Jonah was in the middle of it all so it is time for Jonah to go to work. However, he was trained and whatever his background gave him. When Jonah begins to preach, the Bible tells us that a king is sitting upon the throne of the northern kingdom of Israel and his name was Jeroboam the second. You know, we know a lot more about Jeroboam the first and he was the guy that led the disaster and, and pretty much led the civil war that divided Israel in two. We know a whole lot more about Jeroboam the first than Jeroboam the second. But when the Bible gives us the story of number two, it says that he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And more specifically, the Bible tells us that he was an idolater. And for the dozen plus kings that, that would rule the northern kingdom of Israel until God said, you're finally done, there wasn't a one of them that honored God. There wasn't one of them that did right by God. Some maybe were worse than others. It'd be hard to do worse than Ahab and Jezebel, but they all seemed to do their best. And King Jeroboam the second was no different. By now it had been decades since they had known the presence of God. Decades. Oh, it's not that God didn't send them mighty prophets. It's not that guys like Elisha and, and men of God didn't thunder the word of God. It, it just matters that in the capital city there was a religious establishment that you read about in the book of Amos. And they had nothing, nothing to do with God. And so now things had deteriorated and, and when the Bible gives us the story of Jeroboam the second it says that Israel was afflicted Israel was bitter and Israel was helpless I mean you get the idea that everything had crumbled and fallen apart and there was nowhere to go and nowhere to turn a malaise had set upon the people and, and by now they knew they weren't right with God and they knew that they would never be right with God and, and to make matters worse there was a mighty empire empire, a, a ruler coming after him, the king of Syria. Later, it would be the Assyrians that came after him. This time it is to the north in the land of Syria. And the Bible tells us, if you get the picture tonight, that King Jeroboam is on the throne. There's idols everywhere. They have long since abandoned God. It is bitter and helpless and hopeless. And now the Bible tells us that God calls Jonah to go and stand before King Jeroboam. And you read the story in 2 Kings 14.25. The Bible tells 
us that by order of God through the mouth of Jonah, the impossible happens. King Jeroboam II restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath under the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hefer. It's just an incredible moment in the Bible. It's like that one shining moment that rises out of the malaise and, and out of the darkness. There's just one time, just this one moment where the northern kingdom actually gets it right. And the Bible tells us a wicked king finally obeys God. And they go and take the border and stretch it. And God gives them victories. And it all happened because a mighty preacher boldly had the courage to stand before a wicked king and preach a very unpopular message. And what do you know? It worked. Jonah, the son of Amittai, from that tiny little village of gath Hefer, stood before a very wicked king, and he told the king to get right with God and obey God, and the king did. It is an amazing moment in the Old Testament. And I'm afraid for Jonah, it would be his last shining moment. The years are going to go by now, and you know, we don't know how many there were. Oh, there still is Jonah, the prophet of gath Hefer, And you know, that would really matter, wouldn't it? Because 700 years later, well, when the liberal religious establishment was attacking the Lord Jesus Christ, remember what their argument was? They said, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. It would appear they didn't search and look very hard, did they? Because indeed there was a prophet that had come out of Galilee and had preached a bold and courageous message. And King Jeroboam II had responded to Jonah. It is the first known prophecy that God has Jonah deliver. And ladies and gentlemen, they are spectacular results. And God does a work that everyone would have thought impossible. And the victory that is won by the preaching of Jonah to a very wicked king is quite an amazing story indeed. 20 years go by before we hear from Jonah again. You know, there's no reason to think that Jonah wasn't a faithful man of God for those years. No reason at all. In fact, it's hard to believe that God would have ever come to him in Jonah 1 verse number 1 if Jonah had spent the last 20 years backslidden and in sin. You now, the story of Jonah that we know about till this point in time is absolutely spectacular. And Jonah is used of God to see some incredible things happen. But I'm afraid when we come to the book of Jonah, we're going to see the story of a prophet going down. If you're able physically, could I invite you to stand together with me as we go to Jonah chapter number one, verse number one. Would you please notice how this book in the Bible begins? It says, now the word of the Lord came. You will notice it does not say once upon a time. So either Jesus Christ is correct when he repeatedly put his approval on the book of Jonah, or the liberal seminary professors are correct when they tell us that Jonah is just a fable. Well, I'll stand with the Lord Jesus Christ every single time. Let God be true in every liberal seminary professor a liar. The Bible does not begin this book with once upon a time. It begins with now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And that becomes a powerful phrase in the book of Jonah. By the time we're done, the word of God comes to prophets. It comes to mariners. It comes to whales. It comes to Ninevites. It comes to the wind. It'll come to the gourd. It'll come to a backslider. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. And notice the description, that great city. Well, you know, for a multitude of reasons, Nineveh was a great city. It was great in antiquity. You go back to the book of Genesis where Nimrod started the city of, of Nineveh. It, it is certainly great in size, 350 square miles, a massive city in its day. It was great in importance. It would soon become the capital of the Assyrian Empire and the leading city in all the world. I'm afraid when you read the book of Nahum, you realize that it is great in sin. It is great in population. It is great in animals. It is great in just about everything. And so God sends Nineveh to that great city and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. What a charge and what a commission. And what happens next is the impossible. A prophet of Jehovah is going to run away. 
Lord Jesus, help us as we open the Bible tonight. And I pray that great conviction would fall upon this place to our hearts and to our lives. And Lord, may we see Jonah in every single one of our lives. And I, I pray that tonight we would flee from the, 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 the passion of this world and flee from our own wicked hearts. May we run to our Savior to honor him and may the one without Jesus be saved. I plead in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. So the word of the Lord has come to Jonah, the son of Amittai. When the word of the Lord came to him years earlier, he said, yes, sir. And he courageously preaches an incredibly bold message to a very, very wicked king. But this time it is different. This time it is Jonah. I want you to pack your suitcase and I want you to head 620 plus miles to the northeast. I have a job for you to do. And the Bible tells us in verse number three that Jonah rose up and as soon as you come to the end of the word rose up this is the last time in the book of Jonah where Jonah is going to be right with God you know the Bible did say arise and go to Nineveh well Jonah did rise up but unfortunately the Bible says he rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord he rose up to run away you know we'll never know for sure what's going on in the heart of Jonah maybe Jonah thinks I'm not going to Nineveh Lord why don't you send Hosea or do you know there's that old country boy from the South Amos and, and he's pretty courageous in his own right maybe one of these other men maybe those are the ones to go but the Bible tells us he decides that he is going to rise up but he is going to go in the other direction and notice the words he is going from the presence of the Lord you know when you get later in the book of Jonah you realize that Jonah had committed much of the Bible to memory and, and I mean multiple Psalms I, I wonder sometimes if Jonah hadn't memorize the entire book of Psalms and there's good reason to think that way for certain we know that he had memorized great portions of the Bible well if Jonah had memorized the book of Psalms when the Bible tells us he went to flee from the presence of the Lord I'm afraid there's a text he conveniently forgot Psalm 139 verse number 7 whither shall I go from thy spirit or whither shall I flee from thy presence if I ascend up to heaven thou art there if I make my bed in hell behold thou art there if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me it would appear that Jonah forgot that and it would also appear that he forgot to open his Bible and ask Mr. Cain how it worked out when he ran from the presence of the Lord. Because it's about ready to work the same way for Jonah that it did for Cain. And in verse number three, the Bible says running from the Lord now, he went down to Joppa. He goes down to the seaport city of Joppa, right on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. So we watch Jonah as he runs to Joppa to flee from preaching to the Gentiles. It really is fascinating because eight centuries later another preacher of God is going to be in that very same city called Joppa now while Jonah said I'm going to do everything I can not to preach to the Gentiles well as a fellow by the name of Peter comes to Joppa miles away in Italy an Italian man is praying for God to bring the gospel and praying for God to send the preacher and in Acts chapter 10 verse number 5 God said now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon whose surname is Peter so for Jonah he goes to Joppa so he doesn't have to pray to the Gentiles for Peter while he is in Joppa God gives him a command to go and deliver the gospel to the Gentiles and we have perhaps the first of multiple ironies in the book of Jonah you know by my count and I love to take lists when I'm studying through a book in the Bible I found 42 different ironies now I might have found some you might miss and you certainly find some that I would miss but for a short book like Jonah 42 of anything is a lot and everywhere you turn it just seems like the Lord loves to turn everything upside down and what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right and and why Joppa becomes a place where Jonah won't preach to the Gentiles and Joppa becomes the place where Peter thinks you can't and he winds up doing it and then we shouldn't miss that little phrase that's going to become incredibly important in this book it says that he went down 
everywhere you turn, the Bible tells us that Jonah's going down. He goes down to Joppa. He will go down into the ship. He will go down into the sea, and he will go down into the belly of the fish. I mean, it sounds like a good title for a book, Going Down. That becomes the story of Jonah, down, down. And ladies and gentlemen, anytime you and I decide to flee from the presence of the Lord, anytime we decide that this world's got it when the Word of God doesn't, anytime we decide to say, God says, but, we are going to find ourselves going in the same direction that Jonah did. Jonah is going down. And in verse number three, the Bible says he found a ship going to Tarshish. Tarshish is quite an interesting title in the Bible. In Old Testament times, there were dozens of Tarshish. The most famous one perhaps was in Spain. It was beyond the Gibraltar. And, and why to the people of Jonah's day, it was the end of the world. Multiple Mediterranean islands had a city of Tarshish. Well, there was one in Cyprus and Carthage. There was a Tarshish in Sardinia and Cilicia and Phoenicia. They were all over the world map of its day. You know, to them, the city of Tarshish was pretty much like the city of Portland is in America. There's 22 different Portlands. And in addition to the 22 Portlands in America, there's 10 more scattered around the world. And perhaps that's what Tarshish was to them. Anytime you weren't sure what to call a place, you call it Tarshish. I mean, it was just a euphemism. Perhaps Tarshish meant like we used the word, I'm going to Timbuktu. I'm going to go as far away as I can to get away from God. So we don't even know which Tarshish Jonah was headed to. But then again, it doesn't matter because he never got there. The point is that God said, I want you to go to the northeast. Jonah makes a trek to the southwest and he gets on a boat in Tarshish and he says, I am getting as far away as I can from the city of Nineveh. Do you know how serious he was about this? In verse number three, the Bible says he paid the fare thereof. Notice it doesn't say he paid his fare. So this is not the story of Jonah buying a ticket and joining a bunch of other passengers on the boat. Jonah was so interested in getting away from the will of God that he was willing to pay an enormous amount of money. He literally bought the entire boat. So Jonah paid the fare of the boat. And Jonah says, I'm going to do whatever it takes because we're leaving and we're leaving today. And Jonah pays an enormous amount of money. You know, the Jewish leaders and teachers of the Old Testament times, the historians, they tell us that guys like Jonah could have been incredibly wealthy men. And however Jonah got his money and wherever it came from, he thought nothing of buying out the boat. And now he is heading to Tarshish. In Chronicles, the Bible says a trip to Tarshish would take 18 months. You'd need to restock along the way. And it would appear they carried some goods and cargo that would go to certain ports of coal and they'd collect some more. They would need to restock. And of course, they needed to have favorable winds if they were going anywhere. But no matter where Tarshish is, it really isn't going to matter. They're never getting there. And so that ship pulls out from the port city of Joppa. It was normal back then for the Phoenicians uh, to be in charge of ships like this. They were the seagoing people, according to the word of God. They did a lot of the traffic of the Mediterranean. They were great explorers and, and great seamen. And, and so whoever was running the boat and however much it cost, Jonah says, we are leaving and we are leaving right now. He buys out the boat. And in verse number three, it says that he went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You know, Jonah's been preaching now probably for decades. Does Jonah really think that he can run away from the Lord? How many times do you think Jonah must have stood before a people that, that were hard-hearted and had no time for God? And Jonah must have warned them about their hard hearts. And Jonah must have warned them to get right with God. How many times for those years did Jonah tell those people, you're never going to hide from the presence of God? And you have never, never, never hidden your sins from him. And now exactly what Jonah preaches against, Jonah thinks he can do. Does he really think he can run from the presence of the Lord? Does he really think that he can make it all the way to Tarshish? Does he really think that Phoenician soldiers can protect him from Almighty God? Jonah buys out the boat. Jonah goes down into the ship. And now that ship pulls off the docks of Joppa and the they're heading to this place called Tarshish. You know, the experts are willing to step in and 
And they're going to give us the reasons as to why Jonah fled. I mean, I find it rather stunning myself, but you know, the experts are more than happy to fill in the blanks where they feel the Lord forgot to tell us. And so somebody comes along and says, and I got quite a long list, I'll just give you a few of them, that Jonah didn't go to Nineveh because he didn't like Gentiles. Uh, another scholar actually says this, that Jonah didn't like to travel. Yeah, really? That works out smart. Another expert tells us that Jonah had other plans for his life. Another says that Jonah was afraid. One scholar says that Nineveh for Jonah would be like Berlin of the Third Reich. Jonah thought that God's authority ended outside of Israel's border. Jonah wanted to go to a place where God's word would not come to him again. Jonah thought it was too difficult to go to Nineveh. And Jonah thought that Nineveh was too wicked and they didn't deserve to be saved. You know, for whatever the reason, at a time like this in the Bible, humans try to come up with all the reasons why and try to explain what someone is thinking and I've never understood why we have to do that you know to be honest with you when I come to the Bible it is the things I understand in the Bible that bother me not the things I don't understand and there's enough in the Bible to scare me to death that is in pure plain perfect English that any child can understand no there's more than enough in the Bible for me to work on without trying to figure out what it doesn't say and for the record do you know the Bible tells us precisely why Jonah doesn't go to Nineveh? And for all the guesses and all the surmisings and all the, the prophecy stars and, and all these great scholars explaining it to us, do you know the Bible tells us exactly why Jonah says, I am not going to Nineveh, and instead he goes to Joppa and he gets on the boat. You'll find the reason in Jonah chapter 4, verse number 2, where he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before Natar Shis, and here are the reasons, and there's multiple reasons. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Now, for all the guesses of the experts, that's what the Bible says. Jonah says, the reason that I did not go to Nineveh, and there are a number of reasons. Reason number one, because God is gracious. Hey, exactly. Reason number two, because God is merciful. Reason number three, because God is slow to anger. You know, the last I checked, this is kind of a laundry list of some pretty good things. I'm awfully glad that God is gracious and merciful and slow to anger. And he knows that God is kind. And he knows, knows that God just might change his mind. In other words, Jonah has spent decades preaching about a God. He has spent decades studying the word of God. He has spent decades hiding God's word in his heart. And Jonah, from his Bible, understands the character of God. God. For all of the guesses, this is the reason that Jonah doesn't go to Nineveh, because he knew that God was going to do precisely what God wound up doing. And the last thing he wanted was for Nineveh to be rescued. The last thing he wanted was for his political enemies to be saved. The last thing he wanted was for these reprobates to actually have a chance with the mercies of God. So the Bible tells us the reason Jonah doesn't go, because he knew that God would do precisely what God wound up doing. I, I got to tell you, knowing the Bible can be a dangerous thing. And, and knowing the God of the Bible, if we don't have the right heart, can be a dangerous thing. I, I mean, everything that Jonah says in Jonah 4 and 2, it comes straight out of scriptures. It comes straight out of the Bible. His understanding of the character and the nature of God is precisely true. And when you and I fall to the place of Jonah, it is what we know about God that is going to cause us to run from him. I, I got to tell you, it's an awfully complicated place where Jonah is, but it's an awfully dangerous one. So the Bible tells us Jonah rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. Good luck with that. And that boat pulls out of the port of Joppa, sailing towards the west. And then we come to verse number four. And, and I, I love these casual three words where the Bible says, but the Lord. You know, you read that all through the book of Jonah, but the Lord. And it's just like we're never far away from the next reminder that for all of Jonah's conniving and all of Jonah's manipulating, for all of Jonah's plotting and planning, 
planning, the Lord is never far away. And there's heaven just shaking its head at Jonah, saying, Jonah, it just isn't going to work, never has worked, it's never going to work. And all your plots and all your plans are going to fall flat on their face. And they all come to naught with the simple words, but the Lord. And for all of Jonah's payments and for all of Jonah emptying his bank account and for all of Jonah's running from the presence of the Lord and all of the plot of Jonah to get away from serving God, all of it is corrected with the simple phrase, but the Lord. When do we figure this out? When do we finally understand as humans that, you know, all the control we want to put upon our life, that the Lord can just change things with those three words, but the Lord. I mean, how many people spend their lives living for themselves? Money for me, pleasures for me, treasures for me, stuff for me, toys for me, and then all of a sudden, but the Lord. And with those three simple words, suddenly there's a heart attack. With those three simple words, suddenly there's a catastrophe. With those three simple words, suddenly there's a pink slip. And all the stuff that we do to manipulate what God promised to take care of anyhow, he just fixes everything with three little words, but the Lord. There's not a whole lot of the Lord in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3 in the life of Jonah. There's not a whole lot of Jonah saying, what wilt thou have me to do? There's not a whole lot of Jonah seeking the will of God, but the God of the Bible knows, as the old preacher said, how to send his heavenly hound dogs on our tail. And now the hound dogs are barking after Jonah. The Bible says, but the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. That word was usually used in the military when somebody would hurl a spear and it would seem that the Lord is going to war. So the Bible tells us the Lord is going to use in his arsenal the storm. This time he takes a storm and he throws it into the sea. And the Bible says there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. I mean, these mariners have spent their lives on the Mediterranean. They have spent their lives working the sea. And I've got to believe it's going to take quite a bit for these mariners to be in a state of panic. And yet when the Lord unloads a storm upon the sea, it doesn't matter what they've seen in the past. It doesn't matter what the weather people have reported in days gone by. This is the Lord hurling a storm. And the Bible says the tempest was so great in the sea that the ship was about to come apart. You know, Jonah wants to use the wind and the sea to run from the will of God. God. But creation doesn't agree with Jonah. And all the Lord has to do is snap his fingers and give the order. And his wind is going to stir up the sea. And his storm is going to fall upon that place. And the Lord in control of it all sends out a great storm into the sea. In verse number five, the Bible says, then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. You know, these mariners are professional men. They were called, if in Indeed, they were Phoenicians. They were known in the time as the masters of the sea. Well, the masters of the sea are about to meet the master of the sea. And it isn't even going to be close. And the masters of the sea, the Bible says, are afraid. I'm going to guess that it took a lot for some crusty old Phoenician fishermen and sailors to be afraid of anything on that sea. I'm pretty sure that over the course of time, there aren't many things that those sailors hadn't seen. But they have never seen anything like this. Now the Bible says the mariners are frightened men. They are living in panic before the sea, but by the end of the chapter, they are not going to be living in fear of the sea. They are going to be living in the fear of God. And we should note that they are lost men, for the Bible tells us they're going to cry under their gods. Unless somebody was an Israelite who was right with God and they were trusting in Jehovah, the one true and the living God, every other religion in the world in Jonah's day. Why, they had multiple gods. There were gods that were national gods that the entire groups would pray to. There were family gods that families and tribes would pray to. There were personal gods, and, and it would appear that they had some right in their possessions. Whether it was a personal god, the family god, the city god, the national god. Yeah, these gods were getting a lot of attention now as the mariners were pleading and crying out. And in verse number 5, they cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. Could we possibly raise the water level now? And so everything that's not tied down is thrown into the sea. It would appear that some things that were tied down were thrown into the sea. The cargo, the 
the, cackle, uh, the, the tackling, everything they have. They're trying to throw it into the sea, and it's their only hope to somehow be rescued and saved alive. And yet, one more time, do we not have a picture and an illustration of the great human story? I mean... All that cargo was going to provide so much money for them. Every port of call, they were going to stop, switch it out, and bring some more along. I mean, that's how they got their wealth. That's how they got their riches. And isn't it amazing that all of these things that are so important to these people, all it takes is but the Lord sent a great storm. And the next thing you know, humans are reminded one more time what really, really matters. It was April the 27th in 2011 where a massive tornado makes, made its way across Alabama. It started in Tuscaloosa and, and when it was on the ground there were winds almost 200 miles an hour. At times that tornado was a mile and a half of cross. It, it was incredibly massive and it was on the ground for 80 miles. When it was all said and done, 64 people were slain by that massive tornado. I have a friend of mine at the time he was pastoring in Mississippi and, and his hometown was Tuscaloosa and as soon as he heard about the tornado he, he got in his truck and he went to see if he could find some family and, and see if he could be a help and, and he made it to Tuscaloosa just a few hours after that tornado had ripped that city to shreds. It took a while for anybody to get phone contact but in a day or two when the phone started to work I, I got a hold of my preacher friend and you know being a southern preacher they have ways of saying things. You know they just have ways of putting it and that, that a guy growing up in New England can't do. But I, I was talking to him on the phone and I, I said the obvious, I said, well, what's it like, you know? What's it like being there just a few minutes after a massive tornado has ripped houses apart and destroyed businesses and, and brought it all crumbling down? And that old Southern preacher said it like only a Southern preacher could do it. He said these words. He said, it's all stuff. Exactly. It may be a dream house, but when the tornado comes through, it doesn't matter how much money went into the dream house. It's all stuff. It may, it may be a $40,000, $50,000 vehicle, but when that storm comes through and knocks down that big old tree, and that tree decides to land right on top of that fancy vehicle, all of a sudden it doesn't matter what the title says. It doesn't matter whose name is on it. It doesn't matter how pretty it looks in the showroom. All it takes is a massive storm. All it takes is a great fire. All it takes is a catastrophe. And you and I are reminded on a daily basis with story after story saying it's all stuff. It's all stuff. Stuff that comes and stuff that goes and stuff that can never be sent on to heaven. It is all stuff that is going to pass away. And yet, what is it about us humans? We seem to learn the lesson for about two days. And a few days later, after we have forgotten the shock, after we have put away what that earthquake did or put away what that storm did or put away what that tornado or that hurricane did, after we look at all the rubble and they start to clean it up, pretty soon we're invested in building our stuff back. I was preaching a few months ago in Port Charlotte, Florida. And, and a year plus, that's when that massive hurricane, ground zero, I mean, it ripped that place to the ground. And it was barely through with the storm before people were ready to build their dream houses yet again. How many times? How much money? How much effort? How much wealth? How much do we throw away on all the stuff of this world that somehow one more toy is going to make me happy? That one more new thing is all that I need? That if I can just get this, I'll be the happy lady, the happiest guy in the world, and we invest our life in the stuff of this world to be reminded again and again and again that one day the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but it is he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, we often hear the story, and I preached it told many times, sure Brother Mills did, any preacher that has an illustration book, they do have these things, any preacher with an illustration book has told the story of those two guys that were at the cemetery and they were watching the body of their beloved friend, a millionaire, as it was being placed into the ground. And as the casket was going into the hole, one guy leaned over to the other and he said, how much did they leave? And of course, you know the answer. The guy leaned over and he said, well, they left it all. You know, I have my version of the story. One day the trumpet sounds and the Lord descends from heaven with a shout and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain... <coughs> 
in a twinkling of an eye, in a heartbeat. We're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You know, my version of the story goes that when Jesus comes, there's going to be two angels, and they're going to watch, as the old song says, when the saints go marching in. Technically, the saints are going to go flying in, but who needs to get technical? So the saints come marching in, and I can see one angel lean over to the other angel, and, and he says, I wonder how much did they leave behind? And the angel answers, of course, they left it all. As you know, if the Lord Jesus comes tonight, you and I are leaving it all. It is, suddenly isn't going to matter how many zeros are on the bank account. All of a sudden, it isn't going to matter how pretty the house. It isn't going to matter how fancy the vehicle. All the things that humans live for, all the toys and all the treasures, and all the things that we think we've got to have to make us happy. Unless we have spent our life laying up treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal. Unless we have lived for eternity we're going to discover that it is not some of it that's left behind, that it is not most of it that is left behind. It is all left behind. And we are reminded in our Bible one more time that when the Lord simply sends one little old storm out into the sea, all the cargo, all of the wares, and all of the stuff, the next thing you know, it's in the bottom of the sea. And the mariners can only hope that they're not going to join their cargo in the sea. So where is Jonah as they are panicking and they're tearing the ship apart? Where is Jonah as the winds are howling and the ship is being rocked? Where is Jonah when everybody else is having a first-class heart attack and they're all in a state of panic? The Bible says in verse number 5 that Jonah was, who would have thought, gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. I mean... It would appear Jonah went into one of the cargo holds. And it would appear there must have been a covering on it because the mariners, you get the idea, kind of discovered him. Maybe when they're trying to find more cargo to throw away, somebody comes to the only passenger on the boat and they find Jonah. He had gone down into the boat, into the bowels of the ship. He had gone into the ship's hold. And, and the words pretty much tell us that Jonah wasn't just sleeping. That somehow, someway, Jonah was out cold. I, I don't know how he did it. I got to tell you, you you know, the older you get, the more you wish you could sleep once in a while. And, and, and however Jonah got out cold, I don't know. I don't know. Somebody mentioned, you know, the, the magic M word, but however Jonah does it, Jonah is out cold and even a storm can't wake him up. And while God hurls the storm out on the sea, and while the sea is raging in every direction, and while the ship is falling apart, and while the mariners are in panic mode, throwing everything overboard... There is Jonah in the cargo hold, and the Bible tells us that Jonah is fast asleep. You know, the first time we find Jonah in the Bible, he's looking pretty much in the face of a wicked king, telling him to get right with God and do what God wants him to do. Now when we come to the book of Jonah, it begins with number one, Jonah getting clear-cut instructions from God, and he does just the opposite. And now, now with the world falling apart, now with chaos on every side, now with everybody's life in danger, Jonah is not just sleeping, Jonah is fast asleep. Down to Joppa, down into the hold, he is laying down. And you and I are reminded one more time that the story of Jonah is the story of a man going down. Well, in verse number six, he's got an appointment with the shipmaster. The shipmaster is the guy who runs the boat. And the Bible tells us the mariners, they're the guys who work the lines. The shipmaster came to him and said unto him, and, and isn't this the question of Jonah chapter number one? What meanest thou, O sleeper? You know, Jonah pretty much hasn't lost a thing, has he? This shipmaster, this guy has lost a lot. By now, he has lost the wares. I mean, that's how he puts food on the table. That's how he pays the bills. He has lost all that cargo, and he's responsible for it. I mean, he is, he is on the verge of losing his boat. And if that weren't enough, the mariners are all on the verge of losing their lives. And with these humans losing everything... The Bible tells us that Jonah is sleeping. What meanest thou, O sleeper? 
By now, Jonah should have either been in the city of Nineveh or somewhere on the road to Nineveh and preaching to a people to repent and turn to Jehovah. And instead, while the world is literally falling apart around him, Jonah has gone down into the cargo hold of this ship and he is not just sleeping, he is fast asleep. He is to the place where he can barely be awakened. Jonah sleeping soundly while his world is literally crashing and falling apart. And so the message that Jonah should have been preaching to Nineveh now is the message that an unsaved shipmaster is preaching to Jonah. Do you see the words in verse number six? Arise, call upon thy God. I mean, that is exactly what happens in Nineveh. They're going to ultimately arise and call upon God. And those are the words that should be coming from the mouth of Jonah. Jonah's the one who ought to be in Nineveh saying, Arise and call upon thy God. And even if he backslid and ran away from God, he should be on the deck of that boat telling those unsaved me, pagan mariners to arise and call upon thy God. And yet the guy preaching the message in verse number six is the unsaved shipmaster. God told Jonah back in verse number two, arise and cry. And when Jonah ignores the message of God, now the unsaved shipmaster is preaching the same message to him. Arise and cry. He didn't listen to God's word in verse number two. And, and you can be certain he's not going to listen to the shipmaster in verse number six. As for Jonah, he must have thought it was an entire nightmare as the shipmaster is rebuking him. What is it with Jonah? I mean, forget the fact that you're in the middle of a storm that is like no other storm. How could you sleep through that? But how could you sleep when you just don't even seem to care about anything or anybody? How could a child of God, how could a prophet of God, and remember we're not talking about a guy with a record of being backslidden. We are talking about a man that the Bible tells us has an amazing story in his life of boldness and courage, of faithfulness, a man who knows the Bible from cover to cover. And now the Bible says that his heart has grown so cold and it has grown so indifferent that the pagan has to come and say, call upon God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. This is what happens to Jonah. Fast asleep while his world is falling apart. Fast asleep while the world is on the precipice of an eternal hell. Fast asleep when nobody, nobody knows any way to be saved. Jonah is fast asleep. Is that where we're at tonight? I mean, there are multiple scriptures, are there not, that remind a child of God it's time to wake up. So when do we wake up? I mean, we've heard it a multiple times, right? How many revival meetings? I hate to answer how many I've been to. That's going to be a pretty big number. But for Shalom Baptist Church, how many revival meetings? You know, Brother Mills loves the preaching of the Bible. And, and for, for a long time, Brother Mills brought in preacher after preacher. And how many messages does Shalom Baptist Church listen to? You know, I listen to preaching all day. How many messages do I listen to? How often do you and I listen to the preaching of the Word of God and some of us it's not just days or even weeks or even months. But for some of us, has it not been decades? I mean, if we started counting how many times we have heard a preacher stand up and say, repent and return to the Lord and let the Lord revive our hearts, how many times is that? How big is that number? For some of us, it is into the thousands. So the question tonight then, as well could have been asked Jonah, it is not, Jonah, do we need to wake up? Because Jonah knows the answer to that. I know the answer to that. And you know the answer to that. The question is not, are we supposed to wake up? Because you and I and Jonah, don't we all know the answer? to that. So the question from the Bible, when are we going to wake up? So what is it really going to take? I mean, the Bible says in Romans 13, 11, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. I, I don't know when Jesus is coming, and I know you don't know when he's coming. But I think we all know that we're a couple hours closer to the return of Christ than we were when we met here this morning. The Bible says now is the time to wake out of sleep. So when do we decide to wake up? In Matthew 25, 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and 
slept. So when do we decide to wake up? When do we finally realize that he is coming? That one day in the twinkling of an eye, there'll be no time to get right. There'll be no time to get ready. There'll be no time to witness to the unsaved loved one. There'll be no time to go to the neighbor. There'll be no time for you and for me ever to get the gospel out again. That day is coming when in the twinkling of an eye, like a thief in the night, we are out of here. So when do we decide to wake up? How about Matthew 26, verse number 40? He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So when do we finally decide to pray? I mean, how many more messages do we need to hear? You're supposed to pray. Do you know that by now? Yeah, yeah, child of God, we're supposed to pray. Oh, really? Is that breaking news? I, Brother Mills never preached on that. That nobody ever stood here and said, You and I need to build a prayer life and you and I need to invest ourselves in seeking God and pleading with God and begging God so when do we finally decide that prayer time is more important than Fox News when do we finally decide that prayer time is more important than fun and games that prayer time is more important than watching TV when do we finally say it's time to wake up and pray how about Ephesians 5, verse number 14? Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So when do we wake up? When do we finally decide to rise up from the dead and listen to the light of our Savior, the light of the Word of God? In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So when do we do this? When do we do this? Because here is Jonah fast asleep while the world is falling apart. Here is Jonah fast asleep while the ship is breaking at the seams. Here is Jonah fast asleep while piles of unsaved mariners are living in panic. Jonah's fast asleep with Nineveh dying and going to hell. So when do we finally decide to wake up thou that sleepest? Awake, O oh sleeper. Awake, O oh sleeper. When do we finally wake up? When do we finally say, what I know in my head, I'm going to believe in my heart? When are we finally going to decide, you know, this is so serious that I am going to ask God to revive my heart. And I am going to mean business about doing what God says to do. And I'm going to get working on my unsaved neighbor. And I am going to get back to the Bible. And I am going to build a prayer life. When do we finally come to the place where we wake up and say, enough of what I hear with my ears it is time for me to do what I know so when do you and I finally decide to wake up in his book Killing Lincoln Bill O'Reilly tells the story of a guy named John Parker John Parker was Abraham Lincoln's personal bodyguard and when Lincoln walked into the store of the state box at Ford's Theater, it was Mr. Parker that was to guard that box, and he was sitting outside. Sitting on a chair, the only guy really in the place to defend President Lincoln on that night in 1865. And as they began the play, Parker, as he had done before, decided he would rather get some booze than defend the President of the United States. He couldn't see the play from where he was and probably didn't want to. And, and so he walked out in refusing to guard the president. He knew the guy who ran the president's chariot was a guy who was his drinking buddy. And, and they went to a tavern. There was plenty of time for them to get a few pops and they could be back in time and sober enough that nobody would ever know. And while President Lincoln sat there that night, his only bodyguard, a man who had a history of inappropriate and negligent behavior, he left his post for the last time, and President Lincoln would be assassinated. What are you doing, Mr. Parker? What are you and I doing? Because how many times does God give us yet one more chance to wake up out of our sleep? How many times do we respond to hear the word of God to respond? The Bible tells us repeatedly that when Jesus comes, he is coming so quickly and so suddenly there will be no time for you and I to set things in order. So when do we finally get serious about living for him? When do we finally get out of the cargo hold, wake up from our fast sleep, when do we finally decide to mean business with God? And while the world is falling apart, Jonah is fast asleep. Fast asleep Christians are the sign of somebody who's going down. 
If you're not saved tonight, you need to understand. I, I know we say it all the time, right? The invitation never closes, but it does. Oh, no, it does. One day, the last invitation will be given in this building. And whether you're here to hear it or not, one day you're going to hear the last invitation to get saved. Oh, yes, it does. There comes a time when somebody has their final opportunity. What will you do with the Lord Jesus Christ? And should somebody walk out the door unsaved, they'll walk out for the last time. Should somebody shut off a preacher begging them to be saved, they do it for the last time. And tonight, if you're not saved in the Bible... God never says get saved next week. He never says get saved next month. It says that now is the accepted time. This is the day of salvation. If you don't know him, I plead with you to get it settled tonight. And if God isn't going to break our hearts and change us tonight, then when is he going to get it done? How long do we slumber and sleep while this whole world is teetering on the edge of the wrath of God? Father, I pray that tonight the 